I'm Ramina Agarwal. I'm the director of Ipala. So, Ramina, when you do finally see a tiger, you will not be disappointed. They are an awesome animal, as are many of the other wildlife in this, in this amazing country. So I've worked on conservation, environment, and development in places around the tropics, in Brazil, and East Africa, and Indonesia. But my heart is very, very much in India, and particularly in the area that I've been so happy to be able to get to know in Central India, as in Madhya Pradesh, as Ravina said. And one of the many amazing things about this country is its wildlife, is that the, 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 the wildlife populations and the existence of India as a mega diversity country amidst so much population density and so little land is quite miraculous and amazing. And what we need to think about here tonight is reconciling that enormous resource that India has with its wildlife with the very real need for infrastructure, roads, rails, mining, energy infrastructure for economic development. So how do we reconcile these needs for both wildlife and for expansion of infrastructure? So I got interested in this issue through observing and seeing what has been happening in central India over more than the last decade. And as I'm sure you all are aware, the changes are just vast and very, very rapid. One being the uh, switch from narrow gauge to broad gauge, which I believe was completed last year. The construction of National Highway 7, which has been in legal battle for over a decade. The stretch of the National Highway, which is so important for carrying goods from through the spine north to south of the country. Uh, and that strip in Maharashtra and, and Madhya Pradesh, which has been under a lot of contention because it goes straight through a very important area for wildlife. I'll be driving that very soon, so I'll see what the progress is on constructing the uh, the overpasses. So all of these changes are happening at such a such a speed. In addition to the increase in tourism around many of the protected areas and tiger reserves, and this is work that Kriti did when she was a postdoc, where we looked at in many of the protected areas around the country the increase in tourism. And you've probably all seen sites like this, where there's just been a massive increase in uh, in people visiting. The, uh, the, the parks and protected areas. And on one hand, that's fantastic. It's wonderful that people can get out of the cities and people can appreciate the, uh, the rich biological heritage. But on the other hand, it's a real management challenge. And there has been quite a lot of uh, resorts and expansion and infrastructure which impedes the very function of protected areas. So why is that important? It's beca important because uh, the country has a fantastic network of protected areas, which cover about 5% of the country. But animals, water, ecological flows, all of these processes, they don't really know about the administrative boundaries of protected areas. And particularly, wildlife needs large areas. Large mammals, such as tigers and other, uh, other species, need to disperse need to move between these protected areas, and that's how they've been able to keep their viable population until now. So this area in central India is a globally recognized, important hotspot for, uh, for tiger conservation, and it's a particularly emblematic of this, this, uh, this need to reconcile the needs for infrastructure and the needs for uh, wildlife to move between the protected areas. So we've been after a couple of different research questions over the last few years to try to try to get a base of understanding so that we can make some, some um, recommendations based on knowledge to, how, to deal with this issue of how we reconcile uh, the competing needs for wildlife and for infrastructure exam, uh, expansion. So we've looked at whether corridors are indeed actually being used in, the, uh, in central India, whether wildlife is moving, where they're moving, what are the barriers to their moving, 
Or is this an issue in other parts of the country? And finally, how can, how can infrastructure be designed to maintain connectivity? Is there a way to reconcile these competing interests? So in terms of what we know about whether wildlife are actually using the corridors, we do know based on genetic analysis of, of hair and scratches and scat, that indeed in current times, wildlife are somehow making their way across this landscape really remarkably across some pretty inhospitable landscape and there is the population of, of tigers and, and other species as well whose maintenance of the genetic health of the population depends strongly on their ability to move between the protected areas we know something about where these these uh, corridors are, where the wildlife is moving by modeling uh, the, the landscape and understanding how and where the wildlife are most likely to move and that helps us understand where, uh, where there may be this conflict with infrastructure. We know something about the barriers that are impeding the movement and there are many in this landscape from mines, reservoirs, rails, roads, and so on. This is hard to keep up with because there are new barriers uh, every day. So we, we're, we're trying to understand where if we have an ability to uh, have overpasses or somehow cross these barriers, where would it be most useful? Where to target which would uh, reconnect the, lives, the, the wildlife movement in the most effective way? And finally, we've taken all of this understanding with Critty, been able to uh, have the pleasure of having a project funded through an activity called Science for Nature and People, which is organized by the Wildlife Conservation Society and the Nature Conservancy. And neither Critty nor I believe in doing research and publishing these papers and having it sit, and that's the end of it. We're very interested in getting the, uh, the information used and into the hands of decision makers and used to to, uh, as the base of decisions. And that's exactly what this program is about, science for nature and people uh, around all kinds of issues. We've had a project on this connectivity uh, topic, and we have uh, working with groups of, uh, of not just scientists, but the railway authority, the highway authority, the planners, trying to bring all the stakeholders together and discuss this issue, recognizing that infrastructure is essential, it's important for economic development. How can we put our heads together based on the science and, uh, and try to reconcile these differences? So that's what this entire project is about and what the video is about. So I will now hand this over to Kriti, who will tell you about more about this project. The project is focused on two landscapes, Central India and the Western Cots. My focus has been Central India. Kriti's focus is more the, the Western Cots. So I will hand it over to Kriti to tell you more. And then we will premiere the video, which is the first time that the video has been shown. nine years ago, I'm very happy that we're still working together and we still keep going and I'm, I'm hoping we continue to collaborate and do many more projects together. rather than emotion, uh, which drives a lot of uh, conservation and development debates today in India. So this is the India that most people see. We know we have an economy that's booming at 7%. Uh, this is the India I would love to see. And uh, I think we need to make space for this India as well, because we're just one species on a, pl uh, on a planet of many, right? Uh, 
Um, so this was the official title. Um, for most of our careers, Ruth and I have been scientists, but this particular project was very uh, defined in its motivation that it's not just going to be a bunch of research publications that people don't read. We're going to uh, try and impact policy. We're going to try and uh, engage public, engage the media, and see what are the different ways we can sort of arm and uh, get information out so other people can use it uh, besides us. So just to give you a sense of the kind of growth the 7% is going to lead to, we have um, about 255,000 kilometers of built roads with another 60 odd thousand kilometers of roads being planned for India. These are all sanctioned projects, right? Um, if you look at wind and solar power, um, they have pretty de uh, devastating impacts on wildlife. There's almost no re research done on it in India today. If you look at quarries and mines, uh, similar large scale impacts across India. And electricity uh, transmission lines killing even things like the Great Indian Buster, which, of which about 150 remain in India today, right? Um, then there's the hydrological impacts, which nobody's even looking at. This is canals, reserves, dams, micro highlands being planned in uh, India. So when you put it all together, I think this is a pretty terrifying picture that most of us are sitting and talking about human wildlife conflict, we're talking about uh, uh, livestock predation, we're talking about grazing, when there's actually a much bigger elephant in the room, which is what are we going to do? I'm not saying we're opposed to development, but how are we going to be smart about it? And there are smart solutions to many of this, uh, these uh, issues today, right? So this is something that probably most of you are familiar with, is that less than 5% of India is protected, the green areas, and when you impose all of this development, what is going to happen to this country in, in the next 20 years? And what's, what's pretty fascinating is if you look at India's wildlife history, which I did for my PhD, you see this massive megafaunal collapse of you know, uh, tigers and elephants and a lot of species which were widely spread in India in the 1800s. By 1920s, 1930s, they were kind of shot out and their habitats kind of collapsed. And, uh, but good laws set up in the 1970s, a relatively uh, uh, reasonable IFS, I mean, we can pick, pick on them, but they've, they've actually managed to recover wildlife in many places. And we have more wildlife in India today than we had 40 years ago. But what, what's looming in the next 20, nobody seems to be uh, paying attention to, right? And so this is when we looked at this project. And there is a science-based approach to doing this. So we've, we've kind of divided up this project into looking at, uh, I'm, I'm not getting into the modeling bit, but it's the first part was to look at terrestrial connectivity for all of India, the, uh, looking at what are the largest remaining viable patches of forests left across India and then further, particularly in central India and western Ghats. And no surprise, we have one patch of 60,000 uh, square kilometers left in central India. That's really skewed. Kruger National Park in South Africa is 10,000 square kilometers. You look at the Brazilian Amazon, you look at the Congo in Africa. I mean, they'd be laughing at us today if I said that is sort of our best hope for you know saving wildlife, right? Uh, then we drill down further into the western Ghats and uh, 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 Central India, we find that you know there are a uh, lot of patches, but again, the largest patch in uh, Central India is about 16,000 square kilometers. Western Ghats far worse off, uh, where I've kind of spent the last 20 years working. We have about 3,000 square kilometers, which is the largest intact patch left. There's a lot of tiny, tiny per perforated patches. Um, what we found was that there's been a 72% reduction in these large patches. Uh, in recent times, roads and power lines are pretty much the most intrusive of all the uh, intrusions that we have. 70% of these 5% of protected areas have some kind of intrusion in them. So even though they're supposed to be protected, there's multiple things going on even within the boundaries of these parks. And in some ways, Central India has actually more hope at this point than the Western Ghats, right? And we didn't have the resources and the time to do these to do this for the Northeast, for the Himalayas, and uh, we're hoping that this project will give out the data in a way that other people can replicate this for other parts of India, which we couldn't do. 
The next thing we did is, so what, what I showed you was physically what's remaining in terms of forest cover, forest patches, is modeling movement. And we deliberately ignored the tiger because a lot of people have modeled tiger movement. We picked up some mammals, we're doing it for birds, we're doing it for butterflies, because what a butterfly needs, what a bird needs, what a monkey needs is very, very different. And so this is more simulations, but we're trying to get to, you know, trying to identify sort of uh, points where there's really a lot of pressure converging for multiple species because looking at it just from a tiger's perspective or an elephant's perspective is not enough and we're going to have to do this for many many species and we have the data to do that today and uh, an unexpected outcome was we, we had the first workshop where there were a lot of people interested in hydrological systems and they said why you guys only look at looking at terrestrial stuff so we said you want to join us and look at the hydrological stuff again uh, we will only have to do it for the western guards but we're looking at reverse systems in the guards uh, india is this you know uh, third highest dams in the world we have 5000 large dams constructed and I don't know how many more being sanctioned, particularly in the Northeast in Arunachal Pradesh. If you're not aware of, uh, aware of it, you should be. Uh, what is even more worrying than the large dams are what are these, what are called microhydrants, which are really small dams, which don't need the EIA clearances at, at the center level. And there's thousands of them being sa sanctioned in the Northeast and the Western Ghats because they don't need large set of clearances. They cost five crores. Uh, there's a lot of political backing for putting up a lot of these small dams which you can kind of see in this image here, right? Um, so we're kind of, uh, fortunately in India we've, uh, we've been collecting very good rainfall, rain gauge data for a very long time. So I have, we have one part of our research team who's actually looking at dammed and undammed rivers and basins and kind of looking at the effect of small and large dams. So that will also be a scientific output. So. Eventually, we realize that we'll do all this science, it won't reach most people, it won't reach any activists, it won't reach any policy makers, and so what are we going to do? The, I think the most successful outcome of this project will be this data portal, which will go live early next year. Uh, you'd be surprised, but people hoard data in India, they don't share it very easily. So we've cleaned out hundreds of data layers, it's all going to be open access publicly available if you want to fight a court case in Madhya Pradesh with knowing what you want to knowing what are the challenges you face versus versus Rajasthan, you, you should have access to this data. And so we're going to make it uh, accessible and I think uh, I'm hoping this will actually kind of spiral out into more and more people using the data and fighting their own battles because we can't all do it alone, right?